couple things maybe as we begin and before we pray. So this will shade the way that we pray for our morning class. Um, all right, so two things. Um, number one, today we're talking about Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel are chapters 40 through 48, which are some of the most debated chapters in the whole Bible. <laughs> so what I'm going to be giving you today is what I see in Scripture. And if you disagree with me, that's fine. Uh, you're not going to hell because you disagree with me on this, and hopefully you don't think I'm going to hell because I disagree with you on that. In fact, if you do think I'm going to hell, you should find a different church. Um, these things, these Ezekiel 40 through 48, those chapters are extremely important for understanding eschatology, the end times, and how the end times are going to unfold. Um, and how you interpret uh, that passage or, or the various ways that, that those chapters can be interpreted have led to um, all kinds of um, uncharitable uh, responses from people towards one another. And I just, I don't want that here. I am going to tell you what I see in Scripture, and maybe you'll be convinced. Um, but if you're not, it's fine. And that leads to my, my second point, which is we are picking back up in um, the King and His Beauty, Biblical Theology. We have to finish this by the end of December, because we have another class that's going to be starting in January, led by our brother Dan Schneider, a class on apologetics. And I'm going to have him next week come up and just talk a little bit about some of the books that we're going to be, uh, that we should maybe read prior to that class, if we want to get the most out of it. So next week, Dan, if you can plan on doing that. Okay. And um, so we, we are limited one book at the very least per week. And that's going to be very challenging to me. Um, you guys can pray for me in regard to that. And uh, hopefully it will be helpful and not too much all at once. But we'll, we'll get through this, this book and move on to other things. Uh, and then thirdly, um, at the end of this class... It is unfortunate that I have to go straight from here upstairs to my desk because I have something I have to finish for the sermon this morning, okay? So it's not that I don't want to talk with you, and it's not that I don't love you so much. I, I do. I, this is one of my, fa my favorite parts of Sunday is, is part of that is seeing you. I, I don't get to see you guys all throughout the week, but I'm thinking about you all week. And I'm praying for you, and I'm thinking about you in relation to what I'm writing and for the sermons and Sunday school, and this is one of the most joyful times of the week whenever I actually get to be with you. Um, but I have something very pressing that I need to finish up in this sermon for this morning. So if I just make a beeline at the end of the class straight upstairs, please don't take offense at that, all right? Um, love you guys, and uh, we can talk maybe after the service if you want to talk about anything more fully that was brought up this morning in the Sunday school class, okay? All right, why don't we pray together? Lord, it's, uh, it's very challenging uh, for, for me to stay on topic and to work through uh, the lesson that we're trying to focus on today. I do pray that you'd give grace, Lord, that you would sanctify our hearts uh, by your grace so that we would sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts this morning. Father, we want to look into your word today with uh, eyes that are ready to see what you would have to say to us. And Lord, we long that through this teaching today that you would perfect us or that you would perfect our faith one, one degree closer to that perfect conformity to Christ that one day we will experience. Father, we pray for your mercy to be with us. We pray for your spirit to be at work within us and among us, Lord, that we would this morning have a, uh, an, uh, a supernatural sense even of, of your nearness with us today and of using your word to minister deeply to our hearts the way we need you to, especially in these trying times. 
Lord, as we feel bogged down by, by so much that's happening in the world, we, we need revival in our souls, Lord. We need revival in our churches. And we pray that you would bring that revival that's so desperately needed to the end that we would be more faithful to you and we would stand more firmly in the Lord and in the strength of his might in these evil days. Lord, we ask for this grace in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so let's jump into it. Um, I am going to try to run through this first uh, side of the outline because I want to get to chapters 40 to 48. If you look on the back of the outline, I've got chapters 40 through 48, that discussion labeled as the tough question. Um, That's where I want to spend the bulk of our time, but in order to get there, we have to talk about chapters 1 to 39. So let me just run through that uh, briefly. Um, it, maybe at the outset, it's good for me to say that the king in his beauty, as it's revealed in the book of Ezekiel, is most gloriously depicted in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. That's where we see the fullness of the king in his beauty revealed in Ezekiel. We see God's people restored and fully gathered to himself. We see a river of healing flowing from the throne of God out into all the world, which is a picture of the new earth itself, the earth being renewed by the grace of God coming from his throne in New Jerusalem. So that's a hint of where I'm going with those chapters. But that's where we see the king in his beauty, and I hopefully, hopefully I'll be able to show you that. Now, just some introductory matters. Who's the author of Ezekiel? Ezekiel. Ezekiel. That's right. Yeah, we're not liberals in this room, liberal theologians. We don't, we don't work through the scriptures trying to figure out how we can divide it up and segment it and, and assign certain portions of certain books to different authors. That's, that's not what we're doing here. The Spirit of God carried Ezekiel along to pen this infallible, inspired, and inerrant book, for our good and for our instruction. And um, we, we hold true to that. So Ezekiel was a priest. Ezekiel 1, verses uh, 2 to 3, tells us he was a priest. He was a son of uh, Buzi, or Buzi. And I don't know who that is, but the Lord does. Um, and what's, what's very interesting here to point out is that the Lord came to Ezekiel and called him as a prophet to his people while he was in the land of the Chaldeans. Why is that significant? Any thoughts? No thoughts whatsoever. Why is it significant that the Lord gracefully moves upon Ezekiel to give a divine message to his people who are in exile in the land of the Chaldeans. Because prophets would, can, would typically warn the people of things that are to come and they're already under punishment. I mean, that's definitely one part of what I'm thinking, yes. Parallel to Abraham being called out. It's very interesting, right? It's like starting over, right? Let's let's try this again. It's as if the Lord's saying, "Let's let's try this again." You're being exiled from my land because you've proven yourself unfaithful. I'm going to send you back to where you started. You're going to suffer under pagan, under the rule of a pagan king, surrounded by a pagan culture. And then, here's a, here's a message for you. This is, th- that's a great point. But the ultimate glory that we see here is that God calling Ezekiel to minister to the people while they're in exile is a demonstration of God's covenant faithfulness. They're suffering under the fullness of the Lord's covenant wrath against them. Right? That's what the covenant promised. If you're unfaithful to me, I'm going to kick you out of here and I'm going to send you off into some other land. 
I will forsake you. I will hand you over to the armies of the nations, and you will suffer under their rule. And yet here he sends a prophet to go give them a message, not only a message of judgment, but a message of salvation. Right? And it's just this reminder that even while they're in exile, the Lord had, had not forsaken them, not utterly forsaken them. He had not utterly abandoned them. He was disciplining them because of their sin, but he had not cast them off forever. Right? And that's what we were seeing last time in the books of Jeremiah, in the, books of Lam- in the book of Lamentation. Right? That, that even in Lamentation, there's this hope that, that though the Lord had been uh, severe in his treatment of the people, his mercies were new every morning. And there was a time coming when the kindness and the grace of God would be renewed and, and would be manifested towards them in, in, a, in, a, in a new way. Well, that's, that's something of the hope and the flavor that we get here just by reading that Ezekiel was called by the Lord to give a message to the exiled people while they were in the land of Chaldean, of the Chaldeans. Just God had not forsaken his people. And it gives us hope. Uh, things can get pretty bad in our lives at times, and we can be very unfaithful to the Lord in ways we never could have imagined. And yet, just like with Israel here, if, if God was this faithful to his covenant people under the terms and conditions of the old covenant, how much more so is God faithful to his people under the terms and the conditions of the new covenant? It's, it's, a, it's a lesser to greater, right? That's, that's how we apply that to us. All right, so the author is Ezekiel. What about the date? When was this written? Well, the best thoughts are that this was written uh, sometime between, I believe it's 586. Can you go to that next slide? Oh, 593 and 571. Schreiner writes, Ezekiel's ministry started after Jeremiah's, 593 BC, and uh, being directed especially to the exiles in Babylon and extending at least until 571 BC. So that's kind of the consensus there of believing biblical scholarship. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Stephen Dempster, and you're going to need to just track with me on this, James, as I finish this quote, go to the next one. Uh, Stephen Dem- Dempster, in his Dominion and Dynasty, one of my seminary reads last year, very good book, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, he, uh, he wrote this, Ezekiel is called while in captivity in Babylon during the fifth year of the exile of Je- uh, Jehoiakim. Um, the book is dated by reference to this time of exile, not to the years of Zedekiah, who was not taken seriously. I don't have time to go into all of that right now, but you can go read about more about that for yourself. Uh, Dempster continues, every temporal reference within the book is dated to this time of exile. This is the only time a Davidic king is mentioned in the book. That's not true, <laughs> actually. Um, Another Davidic king is mentioned in this book. In Ezekiel 34, it's the uh, David who is raised up to be the shepherd of the Lord's people. In Ezekiel 37, verses 34, I believe, and 35, or is it 24 and 25? Something like that. Um, David as king is promised that he will be established over the people of God. So it's very interesting There are only two Davidic kings mentioned in the entire book. One at the beginning is the last Davidic king to be over the people of God, the the one that was actually taken seriously. And the very next one, the next king that the people are being being told about is the king of the Messiah. uh, uh, David, the, the, the coming David, right? Not the David that was, but the new David who's coming. Very, very interesting that those are the only two references to the king of David. Anyway, so there's the time frame, 593 to 571 B.C. Go ahead to the next one, James. What about the purpose of the book? Um, the purpose of this book, I believe, is to proclaim Yahweh's judgment against his unfaithful covenant people and to declare the hope of future salvation following judgment. And so that breaks down roughly in this book to um, you know, a, a section of judgment, um, and then strewn throughout, you have promises of salvation. So judgment in Ezekiel 5.6 and 5.11, uh, the reason for that judgment is because of their unfaithfulness to the covenant of the Lord. Let me just read that to you. You can split this page. Um, Ezekiel 5, verse 6. Actually, I'll start in verse 5. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, this, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the center of the nations with lands all around her. 
But she has rebelled against my judgments more wickedly than the nations and against my statutes more than the lands which are all around her. Now, very, let me just pause there for a minute. I don't have a lot of time to do this often, but this is, this is important, I think. Notice there it says, God placed her in the midst of the nations, but she rebelled against my judgments more wickedly than the nations that are around her. What does that tell us about God's expectation for the nations that were around Israel? Though they had not received the oracles of God the way that Israel had, they hadn't received the same statutes and the same um, expression of the law the way Israel had, God still held those nations accountable to his judgments, even though they didn't have those judgments in written form. You see that? Now, the, 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 the contrast, or at least the, uh, the starkness of this reality that God's painting for them is, you, you rebelled more against my judgments than the nations did who didn't have the written form of those judgments. Like, you had greater light than all the other nations around you had. You, I gave you the living word of God. I gave you my statutes and my judgments through the hand of Moses. I I spoke to you from Mount Sinai. I did things in your midst that no other nation around you ever saw or witnessed from any of their gods. And yet you have rebelled far more than any of them ever had. It's very interesting in this book, um, uh, the, the people of Judah, specifically Jerusalem, in Israel, they're going to be described as their system, sister being uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? They're like, and, and then even saying that they're worse than their sister, uh, that they've become worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. And then verse 11 of chapter 5, the Lord says, So as I live, declares the Lord Yahweh, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable idols and with all your abominations, therefore I will also withdraw and my eye will have no pity, and I will not spare. That's one of the greatest forms of judgment, is when the Lord withdraws from us. Um, Praise the Lord, the new covenant promises that will never happen. But they experience that. So there's the judgment, but then there's also the salvation, promise of salvation, and you see this at the end of chapter 16. Let me just read read some of this. This chapter that's uh, really unpacking with, with very graphic language and, and um, very vivid word pictures where the Lord is describing uh, the unfaithfulness of Israel in Ezekiel chapter 16. She was a, she was a whore. She acted in harlotry against, against the Lord despite his kindness and despite his faithfulness towards her. But then you get down to the end after the Lord says, I'm going I'm to bring punishment and destruction upon you because of your unfaithfulness against me. Then he gets to verse 60. Nevertheless, Ezekiel 16, verse 60. Nevertheless, I myself will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember your ways. Okay, so hold on. I will will remember my covenant with you, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. What, What covenant is that talking about? Hmm? There's only one everlasting covenant in the Bible. It's the new covenant. This this is the covenant of Isaiah 54, 10. I will establish my covenant of peace with you, which will never be shaken. This is the same covenant that God's going to speak about in Ezekiel 36. This covenant that includes regeneration, people being born again, giving them a new heart and a new spirit and bringing them into this renewed relationship with the Lord. God promises, yeah, amen. God, God promises, I'm going to make this everlasting covenant with you because of my faithfulness to you. And in that everlasting covenant, listen to what the Lord says here. Within that everlasting covenant, then you will remember your ways and feel dishonor when you receive your sisters, both your older and your younger, and I give them to you as daughters, but not because of your covenant. What in the world is that talking about? Well, the other sisters in this chapter, uh, one of them is Samaria. So we're talking about there the, the reunification of the people of God. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. So you have 
the people of Israel being brought back into and rejoined with the people of Judah in this new covenant. But then you also have another sister there mentioned. Does anybody know who that other sister is? This is fantastic. Really is. Go to verse 46. And somebody just read that out loud for me. Sodom. Your older sister is Samaria. Your younger sister is Sodom. And the Lord says, in this new covenant, I'm going to give both of them to you as your daughters. You think about in the new covenant, uh, Paul describes Timothy as his faithful child, right? Because Timothy was born again under Paul's ministry. Uh, You have uh, other churches in the New Testament, after the gospel began to spread, those other churches were counted as daughter churches of the church in Jerusalem. We use that same language today. If we were to do a church plant somewhere else from, from Oak Ridge, that church would be our daughter church. Or, or maybe we join together with another church that's like-minded. That church becomes our sister church. It's very interesting the language that the Lord uses here. Through this new covenant in restoring his people, he promises that he's going not only to reunify Israel and Judah, but he's also going to give the peoples of Sodom, in other words, the peoples of the nations, to his renewed new covenant people. They're all there together in the same covenant with the Lord. Sodom, you understand why that is. Sodom is being used here metaphorically. It's not, it's not speaking literally. How do we know that? Because Sodom was destroyed. There was no Sodom at this time. So how in the world, in the new covenant, could God promise to give Sodom to the people of Judah as their sister, as their daughters, when Sodom's utterly destroyed? It is no more. It's speaking, God, the Lord is speaking metaphorically there. He's using Sodom to represent the ungodly pagan nations um, around them. So anyway, the Lord promises this, this restoration of salvation, a, a, a restoration where, where Judah would not only be reunited with Israel and Samaria, but but would also be united together with the pagan nations of the world. Thus I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am Yahweh, so that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your dishonor, which I, when I have atoned for you, for all that you have done, declares the Lord Yahweh. Clear as mud, right? So we have this promise, this this depiction of judgment in the book of Ezekiel, but we also have this promise of salvation. And uh, you see that uh, in in the book of Ezekiel play out. I mean, we could we could divide, let's move on to the structure here, yeah. So so in the structure of Ezekiel, the first you can break it into two halves. Uh, the first half being chapters one to thirty-nine, the second half being chapters forty to forty-eight. Those aren't equal halves, obviously. Um, But in chapters 1 to 39, you have this progress, this development from judgment being pronounced against the people to the promise of salvation being brought about by the Lord. Um, And then in 40 through 48, you have God's promises of renewal for his people. Now, just at a high level, here's where I'm really just going to run, okay? So if you have any questions, write it off to the side, and you can email me some other time and ask me about them. At a high level, uh, let's look first at Ezekiel 1 to 39. From chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 3, verse 27, you have Ezekiel's calling in his ministry, right? So he sees uh, the appearance of the glory of Yahweh upon the throne being carried by these four angel-like creatures, these cherubim. And, and what is the form and the appearance of the glory of Yahweh? It has the appearance of a man. It has the appearance of a man who's burning from his loins upward and, and, and all within. And the glory of the Lord is, appears to Ezekiel as, as a man. It's a, it's a uh, pre-incarnate, um, I guess, it, you know, you could, it's a Christophany. It's a... It's a uh, 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 a manifestation of God the Son before he became uh, a man, 
uh, physical human being. So you have Ezekiel's calling in his ministry. Um, chapters 4, 1 to 16, verse 63, there's this real clear track from judgment to salvation um, where uh, the judgment of the Lord is, is, is being uh, depicted in, in the, the destruction of the temple and the casting out of the people and the removal of his presence from, uh, from the temple and not only the temple, but then removing his presence from Jerusalem itself. And then chapter 16 ends with this promise of restoration uh, in a new covenant with his people. Then um, in chapters 17 to 32, you have God's judgment on all nations being depicted, uh, not only Babylon and Egypt and Tyre and Sidon, but also in the midst of that, his judgment on, on Israel uh, being depicted as well. And, uh, it, you know, just and right there, it's just the truth that the Lord shows no partiality when he comes to judge the world, right? Uh, there's, no, there's no special treatment whenever it comes to his justice. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't slack in justice just because Israel was a special people to him. Yes, they were his covenant people, but if they were not faithful to the covenant, the Lord would bring upon them the same judgment that he would bring upon all the other nations. He would not spare any of them. Then in uh, chapters 33 to 39, you have Yahweh's promises concerning his people, um, which, which in promises to restore and shepherd them. That's chapters 33 to 34. His promise to vindicate them against their enemies. That's chapter 35. His promise to renew his people. And this is a spiritual renewal. Uh, that's chapters 36 and 37. Why is that a spiritual renewal? because it's talking about regeneration in chapter 36. When the Lord promises, I will, I will pour out my spirit upon you, right? I will give you a new heart. I will put new, a new spirit within you. I will take out your heart of stone. I will give you a heart of flesh. Oh, and then I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. That's that's regeneration. That's the new birth that Jesus is talking about in John 3. That new birth where Jesus says, unless this happens to you, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what's being promised in Ezekiel 36, that the time would come when the Lord would restore and renew his people through spiritual regeneration, a spiritual rebirth. And then that leads to uh, 37, the revival of the people as a whole and the establishment of David as their king over them. Then you have God's promise in 38 to 39 to defend his people. Uh, this is where we get that, that famous phrase, uh, you know, or infamous maybe, but the, uh, the Gog and Magog uh, uh, discussion. What's going to happen with, with Gog of Magog? Well, you read through that chapter and you're left wondering, hmm, I, don't know, I just can't imagine this. Um, seven years worth of wood for fires in Jerusalem from the weapons of the army that the Lord will defeat. Like seven, that's, that's, I don't understand that. I don't know what that means. And then you go to the New Testament and it's explained for us. Revelation chapter 20, verses seven and eight, Gog and Magog. Who is over Gog and Magog? This is that great rebellion that the devil is instigating among all the nations to join together all the nations of the world in this great war against the lamb and against his saints. So in Revelation chapter 20, we have the uh, description of what Gog and Magog is all about. Um, and I'd, I'd encourage you to go, go spend some time studying that. So that's chapters one to 39 on a high level. Now we're gonna move to chapter 40 and 48. You guys ready for that? Okay. I don't know that I am, <laughs> but we'll see. Let me just, let me give an overview of what's going on in this, in this chapter, a high level of Ezekiel 40 to 48. In chapters 40 to 42, you have the Lord describing the rebuilding of the temple and um, the reestablishment of temple worship. In chapter 43, verses 1 to 12, you have the Lord describing the return of his presence among his people. So in, in, um, 
is it chapters 8 through 11? Somewhere in there, you have the Lord speaking about his departure, the departure of his presence from his people. Well, here, the Lord promises the restoration of that presence with his people when this new temple is built, but not before then. Then you have in chapters 43, 13 through 46, 24, God's promise to reestablish the priesthood, to reestablish the kingship, and that's described there in terms of a prince being over his people. Chapter 37, verse 25, I think, 35. I need to look there, get that reference right. Chapter 37, yeah, verses 24 and 25 de- describes or uh, defines that prince as David, right? So that's, we're talking about the Messiah in chapters 43 through 46. So there's this promise to reestablish the priesthood, reestablish the kingship, and then reestablish sacrificial worship. Then there's chapter 47, verses 1 to 12. That is a promise of God for global healing. There's this river coming from the throne of God, and it's going out into all the world, and wherever this river goes, you remember how Ezekiel describes that. He's taken out into this river, and at first it's at his ankles, and then it's at his knees, and then it's over his head. Right? And, and what that represents is the fullness of God's grace flowing out into all the world, because everywhere where that river flows, there's healing. Right? It's healing of all the waters of the earth, healing of all the lands of the earth. There's this picture of restoration taking place that's not only centered in Jerusalem, but actually extends into all the world. Then you have this promise uh, from 47 to 48, 34, 48, verse 34, you have this promise of redividing the land, so uh, redividing the inheritance among the tribes of Israel, and then the book closes with this wonderful promise of the Lord's eternal presence on the earth in New Jerusalem, the city will be called the Lord is there, Yahweh is there. And that's where the book ends. Now, what does all that mean? That's the question. The tough question is, what is Ezekiel 40 through 48 talking about? And how and when will it be fulfilled? Does anyone want to uh, take a stab at that? What is Ezekiel 40 through 48 getting at? And how... And when will what is described there be fulfilled? He's speaking with respect to the millennium. The millennium? Define millennium. Well, the thousand year reign of peace. Okay. Anchored by uh, Christ's second coming, well, pre or post. Is that what eventually you're going to be getting at? That's, what, that's, what, that's how a lot of people take this, yes. But that's not what I believe. And the feathers get ruffled. <laughs> Everyone just said, what? You weren't paying attention at all. And then I said that. And you thought, what? What did he just say? What did he just say? That is, that is the majority reading of people in our time and in our day under the influence of dispensational theology. The, the most common way to read this in our day is to read it as a new literal temple that is going to be built in the millennial kingdom that Christ will establish on the earth one day. So that's after the church is raptured out of here, Christ returns after what most people describe as a seven-year tribulation or this period of intense suffering, and then he establishes a literal earthly kingdom over which a, a glorified Christ with glorified Resurrected saints rules on an earth with unglorified, unredeemed, unresurrected sinners, imperfect, and a rule that eventually will fail because Satan will deceive the nations again and it will all have to be wiped away and then judgment will come. I don't mean to sound cynical whenever I describe that, but that is what that view holds too. I don't believe that that's what Ezekiel 40 through 48 is talking about. 
And just remember, your vote to reaffirm me as a pastor and an elder is coming up. All right. so, so you can make your voice heard. Um, how should we interpret these chapters? Uh, go to that next, next slide there, James. Admittedly, this, this is hard to work out. And no matter what your view of the end times is, and no matter what your view is of what this is talking about and how it will be fulfilled, every single view has very difficult issues that they cannot give an answer to. So, so what I mean is, it, whatever view you take, there are verses, there are statements in these chapters that someone can take and ask you a question about, and you will not be able to give an answer for them with your view. Okay, so no matter what view it is. So there are, there are very difficult issues that are uh, involved in this chapter. I just want to acknowledge that, but maybe, maybe some, some guidance in how we interpret this. So how, go to the next slide, please. I think I need, James, is there any way we can get a clicker at all for that back there? We'll talk later. Let's make sure we do that, though. Some say, I would even say most say, that we're to interpret this literally. And what I mean by literally and what they mean by literally is hyper-literally. That is, we're to interpret this literalistically, okay? Uh, the promise is a literal temple that will be rebuilt and instituted during what is called the Millennial Kingdom, just as was mentioned. A time when Jesus establishes a little literal reign on the earth, the church has been raptured out, the tribes of Israel are converted, and rule with Christ over the nations from Jerusalem with glorified saints who have participated in the first resurrection. Go to the next slide. There are some problems with interpreting this hyper-literally, and I just want to point that out, point some of those problems out. First of all, the New Testament does not teach this kind of division between God's Jewish people and his Gentile believers. You may not understand the, rever uh, the, uh, uh, the relevance of that to this discussion, but it's actually really important. Does God have two different covenant people, or does he have one covenant people? One. Are you sure? Okay. So, if the church were to be raptured out of the world, and Jesus returns and converts all the Jews as his covenant people, but in a different kind of covenant than what the other believers who are raptured out are going to experience, then how can it be said that he only has one covenant people and not two? If he deals with those two different groups, if he deals with them differently according to the promises of different covenants, then how is that not two different covenant people? We don't find in the New Testament a division between Jew and Gentile, do we? The New Covenant erases, abolishes the dividing wall of hostility that existed between the two, and Jesus makes in himself, Ephesians chapter 2, he makes in himself one new man to replace both groups, Jew and Gentile. So in the new covenant, there is not Jew and Gentile. There is not slave and free. There is not male and female. When it comes to the promises and the conditions of that covenant, we are all one in Christ. Christ is all, and Christ is in all, and that's what matters. So this is where it's relevant to understand what Paul is saying in Romans 9 and 10 whenever he talks about not all who are of Israel, not all who were born of Israel actually are true Israel. Paul says that. That's not me saying that. Romans 9 says that. You want me to read it? Just so we all make sure that we're talking about the Bible here. Not all who are from Israel truly are of Israel. It's the it's the descendant of promise, the seed of promise that Paul says. That, that is the true Israel of God. And Romans 9 goes on to argue 
that's made up of both Jewish and Gentile believers. So for instance, move, go ahead in your mind to Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, Paul is talking about God's covenant people, and he describes it as being connected to, to an olive, uh, um, olive tree, right? So, so there's one olive tree, and a branch is either broken off or a branch is grafted in, but it's still only one tree, right? There's only one covenant people of the Lord. There's not a natural people and then an unnatural people that the Lord has. They are, they are in Christ, in the Messiah, they are unified and brought together as one. That was the promise of Ezekiel 16 that we read earlier, right? In this new covenant, Judah would not only have a reunification with Israel, but also would be united together with the nations. And they would be one people within this new covenant of the Lord. Romans 11, there's, there's only one olive tree, and you're either broken off or you're grafted in. Ephesians 2.14, there's only one new man that replaces the two. Uh, and, then, and, and, and this is really important. Here's a significant one. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. After it says in chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 that the Gentiles were strangers to the covenant of God, they were, they were not part of the commonwealth of Israel, they did not possess any of the inheritance of the promises that were given to Israel, then Paul goes on to say in chapter 3, verse 6, that, that they are now, Gentiles in Christ, are now fellow heirs with the saints. That means that, that what the saints and what Paul's referring to there are the, the believing people of God from the past. What the saints have inherited, the promises of God that they inherit, Gentile believers now also inherit because they are co-heirs with them. One people of God. Does that include the promises of Ezekiel 40 through 48? Isn't that part of the inheritance that God has promised his covenant people? This new temple, this restoration of his presence, this healing of the nations? If that's promised to the covenant people of God from Israel, then Gentiles in the new covenant have been made co-heirs with Israel in those promises. That's Ephesians 3, verse 6, again, by the way. All right, so, so move on. Uh, next slide, please. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. It says, As many as are the promises of God, in Christ they are yes for us. As many as are the promises of God, in Christ they find their yes. Now that means, okay, so as many as are the promises, does that, does that leave any promises outside of that description? Are there any promises that God has made to anyone that are outside of Christ? No, there are not. There are no promises whatsoever. So whether we're talking about promises of salvation or we're talking about land promises, kingdom promises, there are no promises that God has made to anyone that will ever be given them outside of Christ. So that's one thing. Secondly, for all of those who are in Christ, those promises are what? Yes and amen. For everyone who is in Christ, all the promises of God, as many as they might be, everyone who is in Christ is an heir of those promises. Now, is that only for Jewish people? What's it like the land promise? Is that only for Jews? Is that only for Israel? Or are Gentiles also included in that promise of living with God in his land in fellowship with him? Gentiles will be included in that. So doesn't that include the promises of Ezekiel 40 through 48? Yes, it does. Go to the next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait. That was... Go, go back one point. Seth. Can I ask a question? Yeah, you can. Uh, do, do you mean that literally? Like the, the land promise? I mean, 
Because I'm just trying to think, aren't, aren't there promises that were already fulfilled? So in Matthew 5, Jesus says the meek shall inherit what? The earth. Is that a land promise? But specifically the land promise. Hold on. Okay. In Romans chapter 4, Abraham was promised to inherit what? Not just the nations. It uses a word there. Here, let me read it to you. Most people think that Abraham's land promise is limited to what we know of in the Old Testament as the promised land. But that's not actually what Paul says in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 13, it says, For the promise to Abraham and to his seed that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So is Abraham's, is the promise of land that is made to Abraham, is that only a promise for the Old Testament promised land? Or does it mean something more than that? According to the Apostle Paul, the promise is that Abraham would inherit not just the promised land of the Old Testament, but that Abraham would inherit the world. Isn't that what believers, both Jew and Gentile, are going to inherit in the new heavens and new earth? Yeah. It is. So what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to get at is there is a problem interpreting Ezekiel 40 through 48 as strictly and only applying to the people of Israel. Part of the problem is that God does not, in the New Testament, God does not allow for a division between Jew and Gentile believers. They are one people united together as one in Christ. They're not two different covenant people, and therefore God is not going to treat them in two different covenant ways. Secondly, all of God's people are made heirs of all of God's promises in Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 1.20. Every single promise, as many as there might be, that God has given to the world, to anyone in the world, as many as those promises are, they find their yes in Christ. And therefore, if you are in Christ, those promises belong to you just as much as they belong to someone else who is in Christ. Do you know why? Because ultimately, all of the promises of God, even in the Old Covenant, were made to Christ and not to anyone else. This is Galatians 3.16. Right? The promise to Abraham and to his seed. Right? It came not from the law, but before the law. And the point there is the promises that were made to Abraham were actually promises that ultimately were made to Abraham's seed. And who is that seed? The people of Israel. Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is true Israel, right? He is the, he is the one who, has, who strives with the Lord, the, the true Israel of God. That's Jesus. And so Jesus has come as the fulfillment of everything that the old covenant people of Israel were typifying, what they were, what they were picturing. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. So all of God's people are made heirs of, God's, of all of God's promises in Christ. And then third, a third problem with, with interpreting Ezekiel 40 through 48. This is a really big issue for me. And not just for me, but theologically, this is a problem. The third issue with, treating, uh, with interpreting this literalistically is that it shows that in some point in the future, there's going to be a reversion back to the shadows that the New Testament says were fulfilled in Christ. Shadow forms of worship that the New Testament says were fulfilled and done away with in Christ. So, for instance, sacrifices. Contrary to the teaching of the New Testament, in Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48, we find God promising that there will be this reversion back to animal sacrifices being offered to him and saying that that will be pleasing to him somehow. Now, not just, and, and, and a lot of dispensationals like John MacArthur will say, well, those are just memorial sacrifices. 
They're just like, like the way that we partake in the Lord's table. It's just, it's a memorial of some other reality. So also are these sacrifices. They're just a memorial of, of something that Christ has already accomplished for them. But that's not how Ezekiel presents it in these chapters. He actually says that these chapters are accomplishing atonement. They are bringing about an at one with God. They're dealing with sin. They're satisfying wrath. They're making expiation of sin. They're removing sin from the people, and they are reconciling the people to God. That's what these sacrifices in Ezekiel 40 to 48 are doing. Now, how can that fit with what the New Testament says the sacrifice of Christ already accomplished? Hasn't Christ made an atonement once for all? That's, that's Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10. Right? He has made, uh, in offering his body, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Uh, he has offered one sacrifice to atone for sin at the end of the ages. He offered himself up once for all. Right? Uh, Hebrews 9, 26 and 27. There's only one. Uh, Hebrews 13. He gave himself as the final sin offering. Outside the camp, he suffered, right? And, and therefore, we're to go with him outside the camp. We, we, Hebrews 12, we have an altar to eat from, or Hebrews 13, we have an altar to eat from that those who serve the shadow temple have no right to partake in. All of this, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 10, the, the Messiah, the servant of Yahweh, would give himself as the fulfillment of the burnt offering. If he would render his soul as a, or excuse me, as a guilt offering, if he would render his soul as a guilt offering, he would see his offspring, he would prolong his days, and the will of the Lord would prosper in his hand. The, the scriptures everywhere testify that sacrificial worship has been done away with in Christ. Now, how is it then that God has purposed that in some future millennial kingdom, he's going to reinstitute sacrifices that are accomplishing atonement for him and his people, and that not be offensive to him in making a statement about the insufficiency of the sacrifice of his son. That's a problem for me. Secondly, we need to, we need to really pick it up here, but secondly, circumcision will be reinstituted. Uh, circumcision is reintroduced as a divider between the people of Israel and the Gentiles. Everyone who is not circumcised and everyone who is from the nations cannot come into the temple of Yahweh in order to worship. So that becomes definitional. Circumcision becomes definitional of a relationship with Yahweh. Now, does that comport with the New Testament? How about the book of Galatians? The book of Galatians says that if you hold up circumcision as something that is vital for your relationship with Yahweh, what has happened? You've cut yourself off from Christ. You have fallen from grace. You've removed yourself from a saving relationship with the Lord. Philippians 3.3, we are the true circumcision. Not those who have been circumcised in the flesh, but those who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. That's what true circumcision is in the New Covenant. Colossians 2.12-13, uh, circumcision was nothing but a picture that foreshadowed, not baptism, Presbyterians, but regeneration. Circumcision finds its fulfillment in being born again, the circumcision of the heart. So how is it then that the Lord has this purpose in the future, in some millennial kingdom, to reinstitute a practice that the New Testament says if it's held up to that degree, actually cuts you off from a saving relationship with God. Doesn't fit with me, in my mind. Go to the next one, please. The Levitical priesthood is reestablished. This is a big problem. Because if this is true, as Ezekiel says, the, 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 uh, uh, the sons of Zadok, uh, this is, that's the high priest that replaced um, Abiathar under Solomon. Abiathar was the unfaithful uh, priest who proclaimed, um, oh man, I'm getting names mixed up, I think. He proclaimed David's other son as king. He anointed him as king. 
And when Solomon became king, he had him replaced with Zadok. And here in Ezekiel, the Lord says, the, the priest of Zadok, that is, those who are faithful to me, I will reestablish as, as the priesthood of the Levites, and they will serve me at these altars. Now, that means that if the Levitical priesthood is reinstituted in the millennial kingdom that's coming, Jesus himself will not qualify as a priest in the millennium. Because Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 through 25, he was not of the lineage of Levi. He was of Judah. And his priesthood does not come from the priesthood of the Levites. His priesthood comes from the promise of Melchizedek. He shall be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, Psalm 110. So if the Levitical priesthood is reinstituted in, the, in this millennial kingdom that's coming, Jesus himself disqualifies as a priest. So no wonder the other sacrifices would have to be reinstituted, right? Someone's got to make atonement, and it can't be Jesus because he's not a Levitical priest. That's a problem. I don't mean to be so passionate about that, but I, it, it really does undermine this, the, the, uh, the finality of the gospel of Christ to believe this kind of teaching. Now, if that's not what this is talking about, then what is it talking about, right? That's the question. Um, let me give a couple rules here. We've got one and a half minute. One and a half minutes. Ready? All right. Some guidance for interpretation. Here are some rules. Number one, the Holy Spirit is the only infallible interpreter of prophecy. We are not. The Holy Spirit is. Where do we find the Holy Spirit's interpretation of Old Testament prophecy? In the New Testament. Number two, Jesus and the apostles taught us how to interpret the Old Testament. Not only whenever they reference Old Testament prophecies and say that they've been fulfilled, but also in the method they use to interpret those Old Testament prophecies. That gives us our method for how we are to interpret the Old Testament as well. Number three, our interpretation of these passages in Ezekiel cannot contradict clear teaching of other parts of Scripture. If your interpretation of Ezekiel 40 through 48 is in contradiction to what other parts of Scripture clearly teach, then you are wrong in your interpretation. Okay? Amen? All right, so is there anywhere in the New Testament that shows how and when Ezekiel 40 through 48 will be fulfilled? Yes, there is. And it's found in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Let me just read from that. If you can spare me one minute. I'll read from that and we'll be done. You can go study it more on your own if you would like. Revelation 21, verse 10. Remember in Ezekiel 48, it talked about 12 gates being listed as the 12 tribes of Israel. Each, each tribe has a name over one of those 12 gates around this restore, restored Jerusalem. Just keep that in mind as we read this. John says in Revelation 21.10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her brilliance was like precious stone, as a stone of crystal, clear jasper. It had a great high wall. It had 12 gates, and at those gates, 12 angels. And the names have been written on those gates, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. That's Ezekiel 48 by the way, 31 through 33, I think. There were three gates to the east, to the north, to the south, and to the west, and that's also depicted in Ezekiel 48. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So you have this union of Israel and the Jew and Gentiles right here in this one people, right? Uh, the, the gates of Israel and the foundation of the apostles. We're talking about believers in Christ. You skip down to verse 22. I saw no sanctuary in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its sanctuary. The city has no need for sun or of moon to shine in it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be closed by day, nor will there be night there. And they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And nothing defiled nor one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's a fulfillment of circumcision. Nothing, un, nothing defiled will come into it. Only those who are pure will come into it. That's what circumcision pictured. The fulfillment of that is regeneration. Only those who are born again 
will enter into new heavenly Jerusalem. Chapter 22, then he showed me, uh uh-oh, he showed me a river. Where's that found? Ezekiel 47. He showed me a river of the water of life, bright as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street. And on either side of the river there was a tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. That's what Ezekiel 47 says this river does. It heals the earth. Well, here it is, healing the nations. And there will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his slaves will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have any need of light, of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. And the name of the city shall be called Yahweh is there. The Lord is there. The fulfillment of what Ezekiel 40 through 48 is picturing. So, I know that was a lot. I know that was fast. But go read Ezekiel 40 to 48 and then go read Revelation 21 and 22 and see the parallels. And that's where we find the fulfillment of Ezekiel 40 to 48. It's in the new earth in New Jerusalem that is to come. Father, thank you for this time in Ezekiel. Thank you for the patience of your people, and I do pray that you would bless them, God, that you would strengthen them in your word, that you would challenge them to think carefully about what your word is teaching. God, that you would even refine me and challenge me to think more carefully about what your word is teaching for myself. Lord, I I pray that there would be uh, clarity of thought, purity of heart, uh, true love knitting our hearts together, patience with one another, (laughs) And, uh, and more than anything, hearts that worship you with a, with a sense of fullness, of reverence and worship. Lord, we ask for this in Jesus' name. We pray that you'd be with us in our worship time of gathering together corporately with your people. Um, may your presence still our nerves and calm our minds and help us focus on you and lift up to you sacrifices of worship together this morning. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.